Hello everyone and welcome to our Palm Sunday service. My name's Tom and it's great that you can join with us as we are encouraged from God's word, we sing praises to God and we pray to our loving Heavenly Father. Uh, Palm Sunday is where we remember how Jesus went into Jerusalem uh, and he was received by Israel as their great conquering king. And I think now more than ever is a time when we need to remember that Jesus is king. Uh, Two things have been reminding me of this this week. Uh, The first is a song by Colin Buchanan. Uh, We like to play Colin Buchanan songs to our kids. If you haven't heard of Colin before, he's a great Australian Christian songwriter who writes songs for kids. And he's got this song called The Lord is King. And in the chorus it goes, The Lord is King. He's going to look after everything, every single thing. And that's been a, a really great encouragement for us this week. The second thing has been something I've been reading in the Bible this week. Uh, It's from John chapter 16, verse 33. And Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, I don't think we need any convincing that in this world we'll have trouble. Uh, But Jesus gives us a wonderful promise here. There might be trouble in the world, but in him... We have peace. And he tells us that that's because he has overcome the world. That dying and rising again, he now rules over the world. And there is nothing in this creation that's outside of his control. Not disease, not sickness, not even death. He's in control of everything. And he's going to look after everything. And so that's been a great encouragement for us this week. But as we remember that the Lord is King, uh, we're also reminded that we have sinned against the Lord, that we've sinned against Jesus. Uh, We've failed to live life his way, and we've decided to live life our own way instead. Uh, As we come up to Easter, we need to be reminded of why it is that Jesus entered into Jerusalem, why he died on the cross. It was because of our sin. And so we're now going to confess our sins to God. And we're going to use the words of the collect from Ash Wednesday. So the words are going to come up on the screen and we're going to pray this all together. Uh, Let's confess our sins to our merciful God. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing you have made and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. I will hear these comforting words from 1 John chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We're now going to confess our faith together. We're going to use the words from Philippians chapter 2, which again is a wonderful reminder of the Lordship of Christ, that though he is king, he came down into earth. He took on the form of a servant. He died on the cross, and therefore God exalted him to the highest place. So let's confess our faith together, and again the words will come up on the screen. Though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and every voice proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen.
Antonio Runt. For those of you who don't know us, we're the George Ardis family living and now working in Little Shelford. Simon's asked us to lead the prayers today. So in order of how much we already need a haircut, we are... Toffa. Nick. Vicky and Sophia. Simon's asked me to tell you a bit about my work and how it's affected by coronavirus. Some of you may know that I work at Christian Aid, a charity founded 75 years ago in the aftermath of the Second World War to alleviate the huge suffering of people of all faiths and none. Christian Aid was already having financial difficulties and we were having to make 150 redundancies tomorrow. The coronavirus has made the situation even harder for UK charities as sources of funding have dried up overnight and there's a worry that people will have less to give. There's a real concern that some charities won't survive just as when their help is needed both, both here and overseas. And some charities have also had to furlough, and who even knew that word already, um, to a lot of staff. As for coronavirus, the situation for the communities we at Christian Aid serve is very concerning. If the virus takes hold in the global south, with their fragile economies, inadequate healthcare systems, lack of food, clean water and cramped living conditions, not least in refugee camps in war-torn countries worldwide, the impact will be awful. But there is light in the darkness. The British public can be very generous in times of need. These communities we serve are hugely resilient. They're used to having to make life or death decisions on a nearly daily basis. Their faith and the supporters and that of our supporters and church partners here and overseas is, 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 overseas is extraordinary and inspiring. As the writer says to the Hebrews, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we do not see. So let's remember that we are not victims of coronavirus, but prayer warriors for the kingdom. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you that you love everything that you have made. You are good, trustworthy and sovereign. You are our refuge and strength, our ever-present help in trouble. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Not trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. In all things, that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We thank you for spring, daffodils, tulips, the lovely weather and the beauty of your creation. Church family, friends, family and communities looking after each other. Food, supermarkets and soup, baking and biscuits, cooking and hot cross buns and always having enough to eat. Our NHS and the key workers working so tirelessly to look after us. and. For all those who have recovered from the coronavirus, we raise up to you our leaders, politicians, the royal family. Please give them stamina, wisdom and a servant heart as they face the burden of leadership. All the medics, scientists and researchers working so hard to beat coronavirus, please bless them with insight, ingenuity and collaboration. And all those who are ill, lonely, mourning or anxious, Please may they know your peace and love that transcends all understanding. Those living in poverty or being persecuted, for whom life is already so hard. Please protect them from coronavirus, comfort them and give them a certain hope in the Lord Jesus. And as we end to Holy Week, we remember our Lord, Saviour and Friend, humbled himself to death, even death on a cross, that we might be saved. So let's pray the prayer he taught us. Oh, our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I'm reading from Mark chapter 1. Verses 1 to 11. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. 
confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Hi, I'd like to add my welcome to Tom's and thank you for joining us for our online service for Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter. And a very special welcome to you if this is your first time joining us online. If we haven't met, my name is Simon Scott and I'm the rector of All Saints Little Shelford. I have some church family news to give uh, for things that are coming up this week. Uh, there'll be Zoom invitations for the prayer meeting on Tuesday morning at 9.15, which are going to go out, I guess, the day before. And let me just add to that. Please let us know if there are matters you'd like us to pray about. Um, if you'd like to be in touch in any case, let me suggest using the contact page on the website, but you can do that for prayer requests. You can use it for other requests as well. If you would like to join one of the smaller Zoom groups that have been meeting, you can... Uh, contact us via the website, or even just to make a, a comment. Thursday evening, we're going to be producing some prayers and readings to say in our homes for Maundy Thursday, to mark the last evening before the crucifixion, and that ought to work well in the context of a meal. The Bible tells us that the early Christians broke bread together in their homes with glad hearts, and we hope we can combine that with a call maybe from families to others who are going to be on their own at home that evening. On Friday, instead of the evening prayer meeting we've been having, we're going to have a service of prayer, music and meditation uh, based around one of the Psalms of Lament and the Church of England's Litany. That's just a set of penitential prayers and intercessions and requests, which it seems to me are very appropriate for our situation today. Then, of course, on Easter Sunday, we'll be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus and we're going to have an all-age service online for that. I have one important birthday announcement to give for April the 8th because one of our younger church members will be 16 on that day. Uh, well, he'll be 16 in 10 years' time on that day. So Daniel Romans, a very happy 6th birthday this Wednesday. Now... We are fast-forwarding through Mark's Gospel today to that reading we had earlier from chapter 11. And they're probably very familiar words. Um, every Palm Sunday we might hear them. So I want to pray for God to speak freshly to us all. Let's pray. Lord, please speak to our hearts and our minds and shape our desires, our actions, our thoughts and our words. We pray that by your Spirit you would please transform our lives and our eternal destinies for your glory. Amen. The words I want to highlight as we look at Jesus' entry into Jerusalem are taken from the start of verse 10. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. And I highlight that sentence because it's the theme of God's kingdom, which is prominent when God's king enters Jerusalem. Mark actually gave us a clue in the very first verse of his book that the kingdom of this king is hugely significant. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, he said, the Son of God. And the clue is in that title, Christ, which tells us that Jesus is God's appointed king. In our series in Mark, we've seen the evidence Authority over sickness, healing multitudes, uh, authority to forgive sin, authority over all his opponents so that they always come off worse in debate. It's as if Jesus strides through his world 
as its creator and king. And how important that is for us to remember at the moment. Some of you will remember Joss Sloan from Sydney, Australia, who used to live in Garden Fields uh, for three years while her husband Ed was studying at Cambridge. She wrote about her coronavirus meltdown moment when she got to the checkout in the supermarket with 14 litres of milk. Well, they have five children. That was for one week. But then she was told about a new two-item limit on milk. Six litres maximum. And there were tears in the supermarket. She wrote very movingly about her anxiety and ended with this conclusion. The virus, she said, is called the coronavirus because of the crown-like spikes on the surface of the cell. It's wearing a crown. This virus is a wannabe king. But we Christians have a far greater king. She didn't say this, but part of the problem we have with our attitude is that we are all wannabe kings in God's world. Who doesn't like to be in charge? With each of us ruling in our tiny kingdom of one. And along comes King Corona and reminds us that we aren't as powerful as we think. We can't control every circumstance, the weather, the transmission of disease, the financial markets. We don't control them and we can't. We can't even control things closer to home. A family member's attitude of anger. We are not in charge. Well, I'm thankful as we look at this incident in the life of Jesus that there is a better king in God's world, mightier than Corona, and infinitely worthier than the impostors that we are. I want to draw out two themes about the kingdom or authority of Jesus. First, it is a predicted kingdom, which is unmistakable simply in the way Jesus enters Jerusalem. Each of the four accounts of Jesus' life records his entry into Jerusalem. It's actually only fairly rarely that all four of them report the same event. It happens a few times. The baptism of Jesus, the feeding of the 5,000, the crucifixion and the resurrection, and the entry into Jerusalem. And that's just about all. So here, the Gospel writers are saying, this is a big event. Uh, no portrait of Jesus is complete without it. Now, why do they think so? Well, one reason at least is this, because God had so deliberately drawn attention to it in advance by predicting it repeatedly. And that's why there are so many seemingly insignificant details mentioned in the account. Normally, Mark's style is very economical. Unless something is important, he just leaves it out. So why all this stuff about the cult? Why mention that it hadn't been ridden? Why all the stuff about tying and untying it? Don't you always do that with cults? What's the big deal about the palm branches? And why bother with reporting such an anticlimactic ending to the first day in Jerusalem? Verse 11 says Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the Twelve. So you've had all the build-up for that? Do we really need to know that? Well, yes, says Mark, because in tiny insignificant details like that, the predictions of the Messiah were being fulfilled. What predictions? Behind the inspection of the temple is the prophet Malachi's prediction that the Lord himself would come to his temple to inspect to purge out all the wickedness. Behind the tying and untying of the cult was the prediction of a ruler descended from Judah who would have a tethered donkey cult. That was way back in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. The palms are mentioned in the Psalms, easy to remember. And then another, even more obvious, prophecy connected with a cult from Zechariah's prophecy. So 550 years before ever Christ came to Jerusalem. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Jerusalem. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Do you think that after flogging around on foot 
all over the country for three years. Jesus needed to ride the last three miles into Jerusalem? Of course not. He did it in fulfilment of the predictions of how God's king would come to Jerusalem. For those who had eyes to see it, Jesus was saying, wake up. God hasn't abandoned you. His promises in the prophets are all being fulfilled. The unsatisfied longings of centuries are at last being met. I'm the one you've been waiting for. The application for us is surely to boost our confidence in God's control of human history. How we need that. Things sometimes seem like they're out of control, but they aren't. God has everything in control, working his purposes out, fulfilling his promises. And of course, if he fulfilled some of his promises when Jesus came the first time, doesn't that build our confidence that he'll keep the rest of his promises in the future when Jesus returns? What good news that is. If the destination of human history is guaranteed, then all the grace we'll need along the way is guaranteed by God as well. Of course, or we'd never make it safely to that appointed end. If Jesus is king, then we have the promise of future grace from him, and future grace carries with it the promise of present grace. Help today to get us all home. You and I should not have a shred of doubt that Jesus is God's king. We are not going to be the losers by throwing in our lot with him. His is a predicted kingdom. And God keeps his promises. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge another thing about Jesus' kingdom and authority here. Secondly, it is a puzzling kingdom. Whilst clearly the crowds recognise some aspects of his kingdom in the way he enters Jerusalem, they don't grasp the whole truth. If Jesus is the king of a kingdom, then it is a very odd kingdom. He's a king quite unlike any other king they know. To some extent, Jesus is undeniably playing to the gallery. He times his arrival in Jerusalem for maximum impact. When all the pilgrims were flooding into Jerusalem for the Passover festival, I think 30 years after the event, the historian Josephus put the number at 2.7 million in his day in Jerusalem for the Passover. That's interesting, isn't it? Jesus' birth had gone largely unnoticed. There was no one present at the moment of the resurrection. But his entry to Jerusalem had maximum media coverage, lots of publicity that he was their king. The songs they all sang made it clear. Thank God that David's son has come at last. Glory to God in the highest. The fact that Jesus rides in is also a pointer to his status. Normally pilgrims walked in the last few miles. But a donkey? It's not just recently since Winnie the Pooh and Eeyore that we think of donkeys as faintly ridiculous. Where else would you hear of a king with a worldwide empire riding a donkey? Talk about travelling second class. In Rome, the big processions were normally military ones. So you can imagine a Roman centurion gall galloping up to check on this disturbance here. He's been to triumphal processions in Rome where they do it properly, where the general sits in chariots of gold pulled by impressive stallions straining at the reins. Then there are the officers in polished armour behind him carrying the banners of captured armies and behind them defeated prisoners in chains. But what does our centurion find here in Jerusalem? Lots of people, sure, but not an ounce of splendour, no polished armour, just a ragbag collection of peasants and who's the centre of attention? Surely not that man on a donkey. Don't make me laugh. But that's what we see repeatedly with Jesus. It's very puzzling. But God's kingdom, judged by this world's standards, is often unimpressive. God's way up is down. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve in a lowly fashion. So, 
He was born in a borrowed stable. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And here he rides into his capital city on a borrowed donkey. In contrast to the kingdoms of this world, Jesus was ludicrously unimpressive. But God's purposes aren't apparently served by Cadillacs and a ticker tape parade. The Zechariah prophecy actually explains why he comes on a donkey, not a war horse. If Christ's kingdom was measured by acres and spread by armies, he might well come on a war horse, but it's not. Jesus comes to bring rescue, not revolution. So, says Zechariah, he comes righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. And that's the puzzle. He's powerful, but he enters Jerusalem in weakness. In fact, within seven days, he'll die in weakness. He doesn't assert his rule straight away because he comes to save. So I want to close this morning and ask if you've come to terms with this puzzle, the puzzle of the kingdom, that this king comes gently, humbly, on a donkey, because he came to save, to save you. For the moment, there are the adoring crowds who feel like they've got the wind at their backs, but how quickly things change. In a few days, there's the arrest, the trumped up charges, and the crucifixion, the betrayal by his friends before that. He rides into his city in triumph, and a week later, he's back outside its walls again on the city rubbish dump, dying on the cross to save us. I know things change quickly for us. You may feel that you've just endured the week from hell, but he really did live through the week from hell. And he knew every detail of it beforehand and still went on down that road. The only way he could do that was that he knew he was doing it to serve God's plans, that he was in control and that you and I would benefit. He did it for us. So he was willing to be unimpressive, an outcast, because that is what our sin cost. So ask again, have you come to terms with that puzzle, that you need a heavenly rescuer and that Jesus is that rescuer, dying so we can be forgiven and cast out so that God can welcome us in? Can I invite you therefore today to pray to God, asking him to make the puzzle of this kingdom clearer to you? and to show you how to benefit from that salvation that Jesus brings. Jesus is the one we've got to fix our eyes on, not our circumstances. He is in control, just as surely as we are not in control. So, will you admit to him that you need him to be your ruler? to rescue you from every imposter king, from King Corona, and from your own self-rule. Then ask him to be your rescuer king. The future belongs to him, and he longs for all of us to be part of it. Let's pray together. We thank you, Lord, for always keeping your promises and we thank you that Jesus is the Lord of history, that our future is safe with him. Thank you that he came to save. Please make that puzzle clear to each of us in whatever circumstances we face today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Uh, well, friends, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the service this morning. I've got a little friend uh, that's come and joined me. Um, but I hope you have found it encouraging. And uh, please do uh, join us again next Sunday, uh, which will be Easter Sunday. Uh, so it would be really wonderful if we can join uh, together again as we celebrate um, the resurrection of our Lord. Uh, if you have a comment that you'd like to make or you have a question, uh, you can hop onto our website and you can make a comment through our uh, comment section. Um, otherwise, we're going to finish now uh, by praying uh, a prayer together and the words are going to come up on the screen. Uh, have a wonderful Holy Week and we will see you again next Sunday for Easter Sunday. Uh, let's pray together now. Almighty and everlasting God, who in your tender love toward the human race sent your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Grant that we may follow the example of his patience and humility and also be made partakers of his resurrection through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.